In this video on topic 6.3 and the next one on 6.4, we're going to be looking at the process by which cells manufacture proteins. We will begin with transcription and RNA processing. Genes are the sets of instructions by which cells manufacture proteins. Like other biological macromolecules, proteins are essential to a cell's proper functioning and participate in virtually every process within them. Some proteins act as enzymes that catalyze reactions. Other proteins have structural or mechanical functions. And other proteins are important in actions such as cell signaling, the immune response, and regulation of the cell cycle. To express a gene using protein synthesis, a cell's DNA is acted upon to produce RNA, which is then used to assemble amino acids in a specific sequence. This sequence of amino acids, a polypeptide, is a protein's primary structure. Once secondary and tertiary structure, and possibly quaternary, are achieved, a functional three-dimensional protein is yielded. This presentation will focus on the first few steps involved with gene expression, specifically transcription and an important processing step that follows it. The idea now described as the central dogma was first proposed by Francis Crick in 1957. It is used to describe how an individual's genotype, the combination of alleles they carry for a particular gene, is acted upon resulting in their phenotype. It is often simplified and stated as DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. The central dogma is a framework for understanding the transfer of information in the form of a sequence of DNA nucleotides into ultimately a sequence of amino acids. The process by which this occurs is described as highly conserved due to its near universal nature in all forms of life. As a matter of fact, it is widely referenced as one of the most substantial forms of evidence used to support evolutionary theory and the interrelatedness of all life. Gene expression is also highly regulated in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Although significantly much less is known about eukaryotic gene regulation than prokaryotic gene regulation, some of what we know will be outlined in a later presentation. Before we begin looking at the steps involved in transcription and RNA processing, let's first take a moment to describe the structure and function of the most important types of RNA that are participating. Although there are, in fact, over 30 known types of RNA, the most well-known types and those with which we need to concern ourselves include the following. The first is messenger RNA, or mRNA. It is the responsibility of this single-stranded nucleic acid, which is produced in the nucleus, to travel to a ribosome carrying genetic information. Transfer RNA molecules, or tRNA, are found free-floating in the cytosol. The structure of a tRNA is such that, at one end is a three RNA nucleotide sequence, the significance of which will be observed in topic 6.4, and at the other end is bound a specific amino acid. Amino acids are acquired by organisms via ingestion if they are consumers, or by synthesizing them directly if they are producers. The third type of RNA is ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. Ribosomes are complex cellular machines. They are found free-floating in the cytosol or attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and are comprised of dozens of distinct proteins as well as a specialized form of RNA. Interestingly, about 80% of all of a cell's RNA is, in fact, ribosomal RNA. rRNA plays a critical role in bringing together messenger RNA and transfer RNA, which will be observed in topic 6.4. The final type of RNA that we will see is called small nuclear RNA, or snRNA. snRNA is present in the nucleus and is tasked with responsibilities that revolve around the editing of RNA molecules formed by the transcription process. 
Transcription is the production of an RNA molecule and includes three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. The initiation of transcription begins when RNA polymerase in a person. Transcription is the production of an RNA molecule and includes three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. The initiation of transcription begins when RNA polymerase binds in a precise location on the promoter region of a gene. Promoters are located near the transcription start sites of genes and can be hundreds of base pairs long. Although prokaryotic promoters are relatively simple, allowing RNA polymerase to bind directly to them, in eukaryotes they are much more complex and not as well understood. In eukaryotes, a collection of proteins called transcription factors help to regulate the binding of RNA polymerase to the double helix. Additional regions of DNA, as well as other proteins, interact to form the initiation complex of transcription. Once the appropriate transcription factors are firmly attached to the promoter and RNA polymerase is bound to the DNA, the enzyme unwinds the two strands of DNA and separates them from one another. This model illustrates the very beginning of the process of initiation. In the model, the antisense strand, also known as the template strand or non-coding strand, is used as a template guide to base pair complementary RNA nucleotides. RNA polymerase is responsible for building the phosphodiester bonds in the sugar phosphate backbone of the growing RNA molecule. The RNA molecule being produced is an exact copy, with the exception of the presence of uracil rather than thymine, of the sense strand, also known as the non-template strand or coding strand. If you compare the nucleotide sequence of the RNA transcript to the sense strand in this model, you can see that they are the same, again, excepting for the presence of uracil. During elongation, RNA polymerase moves along the DNA molecule, continuing to untwist and separate the double helix. This exposes about 10 to 20 nucleotides at a time making them available for base pairing with RNA nucleotides. The enzyme adds nucleotides to the 3' hydroxyl of the growing RNA molecule as it continues to move along. The 5' end of the RNA molecule under construction peels away from the DNA template, allowing the two halves of DNA to re-base pair with one another. In eukaryotes, Transcription proceeds at the rate of approximately 40 nucleotides every second. Elongation continues until RNA polymerase encounters a terminator sequence in the DNA. Although the specifics behind the terminator sequence itself aren't going to be studied, the difference in the products of transcription between prokaryotic and eukaryotic gene expression is important. For both, the terminator sequence signals to RNA polymerase to ultimately detach from the DNA molecule. But in prokaryotes, the product of transcription is ready to proceed to the next stage of gene expression, translation. However, in eukaryotes, the product of gene transcription is a pre-messenger RNA, or primary transcript. The primary transcript must first be modified before it can proceed to the translation stage of protein synthesis. Let's take a look at a short animation from the DNA Learning Center, which is affiliated with the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Here the process begins. Transcription factors assemble at a specific promoter region along the DNA. The length of DNA following the promoter is a gene, and it contains the recipe for a protein. A mediator protein complex arrives carrying the enzyme RNA polymerase. It maneuvers the RNA polymerase into place. 
inserting it with the help of other factors between the strands of the DNA double helix. The assembled collection of all these factors is referred to as the transcription initiation complex, and now it is ready to be activated. The initiation complex requires contact with activator proteins, which bind to specific sequences of DNA known as enhancer regions. These regions may be thousands of base pairs distant from the start of the gene. Contact between the activator proteins and the initiation complex releases the copying mechanism. The RNA polymerase unzips a small portion of the DNA helix, exposing the bases on each strand. Only one of the strands is copied. It acts as a template for the synthesis of an RNA molecule, which is assembled one subunit at a time by matching the DNA letter code on the template strand. The subunits can be seen here entering the enzyme through its intake hole, and they are joined together to form the long messenger RNA chain snaking out of the top. Still within the nucleus, enzymes modify the primary transcript in specific ways before it is sent to the cytosol to be translated by a ribosome. Two of the modifications involve structural changes to the linear ends of the primary transcript. On the 3' end, an enzyme adds dozens more adenine nucleotides, forming what is referred to as a poly-A tail. The 5' end receives a cap, which is a modified form of guanine called GTP, guanosine triphosphate. Both the cap and the tail facilitate the export of the RNA from the nucleus and help protect it from enzymes in the cytosol, delaying its inevitable degradation. The 5' cap has an additional responsibility, which is to act as an attachment site for the ribosome, ensuring that the nucleotide sequence is translated in the correct direction. The third modification to the primary transcript involves a process called RNA splicing. In RNA splicing, large portions of the primary transcript that are not used to code for specific amino acids in translation are removed. The length of an average primary transcript in humans is nearly 30,000 nucleotides long. However, the average mature messenger RNA used in translation is only 1,200 nucleotides. We can therefore infer that most eukaryotic genes have long stretches of nucleotides that are non-coding and are therefore not translated. Those non-coding sequences of DNA are called introns. In RNA splicing, the introns are identified and removed allowing the coding regions called exons to be spliced together. The splicing process is executed by small molecules called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRPs. SNRPs carry with them special snRNA, which allows them to recognize, via complementary base pairing, the starting and ending nucleotide sequences of introns. They bind to the intron, allowing for other SNRPs to cut out the introns and fuse together the exons. The result is an intron-free, fully mature messenger RNA. Here now is a short animation, again from the DNA Learning Center, that will take us through the RNA splicing process. As DNA is transcribed into RNA, it needs to be edited to remove non-coding regions or introns shown in green. This editing process is called splicing, which involves removing the introns, leaving only the yellow protein coding regions called exons. RNA splicing begins with assembly of helper proteins at the intron-exon borders. These splicing factors act as beacons to guide small nuclear riboproteins to form a splicing machine called the spliceosome. The animation is showing this happening in real time. The spliceosome then brings the exons on either side of the intron very close together, ready to be cut. 
one end of the intron is cut and folded back on itself to join and form a loop. The spliceosome then cuts the RNA to release the loop and join the two exons together. The edited RNA and intron are released and the spliceosome disassembles. This process is repeated for every intron in the RNA. Numerous spliceosomes, shown here in purple, assemble along the RNA. Each spliceosome removes one intron, releasing the loop before disassembling. In this example, three introns are removed from the RNA to leave the complete instructions for a protein. Cells are capable of producing far more protein products than the number of genes they possess could account for. Humans, for example, depending on the stage of the life cycle, produce well over 90,000 different kinds of proteins. But humans only have 21,000 genes. The originally held understanding was that each gene was responsible for a single kind of protein and is challenged by discrepancies like this. In fact, a single gene's transcription unit can be used to produce, ultimately, more than one kind of protein. One of the most important ways by which this can be accomplished is called alternative RNA splicing. Because of alternative RNA splicing, different protein products can be produced yielding different kinds of proteins than the number of genes can account for. Many genes have been identified and observed to give rise to two or more different kinds of messenger RNA, depending on which segments are treated as exons during RNA splicing. This model shows a single gene that can be transcribed and processed producing two different messenger RNA sequences, which would ultimately result in two different amino acid sequences. It illustrates how, depending on which exons are included in the mRNA, this is accomplished. And that closes out our look at the first half of gene expression. Translation will be explored in the next video. Thanks for watching. Take care.